Um, it's been a long day, but it's all been very, very good stuff for us. Um, our last speaker is um, very important to us. Um, it's Dr. Mike Fraser, who is the director of Cancer Program Implementation at Movember Canada. Um, Movember, I should let you know, is one of the sponsors of this particular program. Um, and we really do appreciate Movember for assisting us with this conference today. Um, let me just read uh, Mike's bio and then he can go into what Movember is doing. So Dr. Mike Fraser obtained his PhD degree in cellular and molecular medicine at the University of Ottawa and completed postdoctoral studies under Dr. Rob Bristow in the radiation medicine program at Princess Margaret Cancer Center. Um, Dr. Fraser previously served as the scientific director of the Canadian Prostate Cancer Genome Network, one of the largest prostate cancer whole genome sequencing programs in the world. He also served as director prostate cancer program at the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research and was a founding member of the International Cancer Genome Consortium, Pan Prostate Cancer Group, a multinational effort to characterize the genome of prostate cancer and to develop molecular biomarkers of aggressive disease. Prior to joining Movember Canada in July 2020, Dr. Fraser was a staff scientist at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center and an assistant professor in the Division of Urology, Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto. Dr. Fraser has published over 60 research papers, review articles, and textbook chapters in the areas of prostate cancer genomics and bioinformatics. In 2018, he was named the Next Gen Star of the American Association of Cancer Research, and he is the recipient of numerous local, national, and international awards for research and teaching. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Mike Fraser. Mike, good to have Thanks you. Thanks again. Thanks. Great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I just got to make you a co-host. Okay. There you go. Okay. Uh, just make sure I share the right screen so you don't see all my terrible mess. There we go. And okay, can you see that? Yes. Okay, great, perfect. So first of all, again, thanks so much, Ken, for the invitation to speak with you all today. Um, it's a huge honor. Um, you know, this this group does such important work, and it's it's a cause that's very dear to to Movember and, and to uh, to me personally. So. I'm gonna talk a little bit today um, about some of the, the work that we've done um, in, at Movember in terms of the work that we funded around prostate cancer biomedical research predominantly, although I'll touch a little bit on some of the programs um, like True North that you just, you just heard about, but I'll, I'll focus mainly on the biomedical side. But really what I wanna talk about today is to discuss where we're going. We're, we're going through a period of transition at Movember. It's all good, it's a very good thing. Um, you know, we're growing as an organization uh, in terms of our, um, our cause areas, but also our scope and, our, and hopefully our impact as well. So I want to talk to you about um, sort of our, the way in which we'll be implementing some of those changes uh, over the coming, let's say, five to 10 years. So uh, yeah, I've said global reach for local impact, and I, I hope you'll see um, what I mean by that. So I'll just start with a quick land acknowledgement. Uh, Movember acknowledges that we are gathered on the ancestral lands, treaty lands, and territories of the Indigenous peoples of Turtle Island and pay tribute to their legacy and the legacy of all First Peoples of Turtle Island. Movember respects and acknowledges harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to collaborate in partnership with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people in the spirit of reconciliation. So I won't go through my own background. Uh, Ken just did a great job of that. I'm not going to talk to you about any of the cool science that I've done in the past, uh, with one small exception. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about really uh, more about Movember and, and where they're going. So um, this won't be news to you, but I thought just to put everybody on the same uh, on the same page, I talked just a little bit about some of the things that are going to be relevant. We talk about prostate cancer, of course, one in eight men in, in, in Canada will get prostate cancer in their lifetime. 
Um, these are new, up, new updated numbers from the Canadian Cancer Society showing about just a little over 24,000 cases a year and over 4,000 deaths. Of course, it's a, it's a disease that is predominantly in men uh, over 50 years of age. Um, you know, nothing predominantly new here. Of course, you see that, that spike in the early 90s with the, the introduction of PSA testing. Um, when prostate cancer is diagnosed, you know, there are a number of challenges um, that, that exist really at the, along the continuum of the disease. And, and, and really the goal of research and, and basic and clinical research is really to, to address one or, or more of these, uh, of these challenges. At the population level, we talk about things like screening. Um, can we identify tests that are more accurate than PSA, for example? Can we reduce the potential harms of screening? Uh, by that, I mean things like biopsy and the complications associated with biopsy, and really about detecting what are clinically significant cancers. Um, in Canada, as in most, uh, most Western countries, the disease is most often diagnosed in stage one or two or localized uh, with no evidence of spread outside of the, of the gland itself. Um, these prostate cancers get, get stratified into low, intermediate, or high risk based on a number of their characteristics. And there are clinical challenges associated with each of those groupings. So in low risk disease, for example, we really want to try to minimize overtreatment. We want to identify those cancers that are, that are really indolent and, and don't require um, uh, you know, aggressive treatment. And conversely, we want to identify those few cases that are uncommonly aggressive and actually do need to be treated more aggressively than, than might otherwise be the case. In intermediate risk disease, we have this ongoing problem of how do you, how do you distinguish between um, in, again, indolent and aggressive disease. And in high-risk disease, you know, the, that goal there is really to prevent progression um, or delay, at least delay progression to local or distant metastatic disease. You know, this is the, the disease that is going to be, um, become life-threatening potentially. Um, we talk about advanced prostate cancer, either that develops from uh, progression of localized disease or that is diagnosed as, as quote-unquote de novo metastatic disease. We really have, again, have a number of clinical challenges for locally advanced disease. We want, again, prevent or delay progression, similar to what we see in the high-risk setting. Um, oligometastatic prostate cancer, which is sort of a, a, an emerging area of interest um, where you have metastatic disease, you have spread of the cancer, but it's, it's only in a few spots in the body and, and, and probably represents the potential last step where the disease can be cured. And there's evidence to suggest that, that uh, targeted radiation can be very helpful there. So again, we wanna be able to prevent progression to distant metastatic disease. Um, and when we talk about distant metastatic disease or what's commonly called uh, metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer, um, we're talking there about increasing not just long length of life, but really about what are called qualities, quality adjusted life years. You know, we want to prolong life, but we want to improve the quality of life over those years as well. So there's challenges that exist at all of these levels. Um, and like any uh, funding agency or, or advocacy group, you know, we have to pick and choose where the potential biggest impact is for men across the spectrum. Um, there is an emerging challenge that's really over the last I mean, this is some data from the Canadian government, but really showing over the last 15 years or so, there's been this increase, you know, in, in the diagnosis of disease in stage three or four. It still represents a very small proportion of the cases um, compared to stage one and two. But if you look back in 2011, only 8% of the cases were being diagnosed um, as stage four, and that is basically metastatic at diagnosis, whereas that... In, the latest numbers we have are from 2017 are, you know, almost 13% now. So it's a, it's a 39, almost 40% increase in the, in the percentage of cases that are being diagnosed at that stage. And that's largely because screening programs have, have, have dropped in, in prevalence. People are not taking advantage of screening programs. There's a number of other, um, uh, other issues there, but you know, this is a major problem. This is the disease that's potentially life-threatening. And we want to make sure that we're, we're minimizing the number of men who are who are being diagnosed at this, at this stage of their disease. The bottom line, you know, is that there's no average prostate cancer. There's, there's, no, um, there's no single prostate cancer. Every cancer is unique. And it's, it's up to us and up to researchers like you've heard today to understand what those differences are and to leverage them to make sure that men are getting the best treatment that they can and living the longest, fullest, healthiest lives they can after a diagnosis of prostate cancer. 
Um, so again, just to summarize at Movember, you know, our, our goals really are, our primary goal in, in the space of prostate cancer is really to reduce that burden. What is the, reduce the burden of prostate cancer in Canada? And by that, we mean reduce the number of cases being diagnosed, reduce the number of men who are experiencing adverse side effects, um, reduce the number of men who are dying of the disease. Um, and, you know, prostate cancer is such a, such a big problem. It's, it's such a prevalent disease. You know, the number one diagnosed uh, male malignancy in Canada, and again, in, in most Western countries, um, it requires partnerships and it requires community building, um, not just of researchers and clinicians, but of men and their families who are living with prostate cancer um, to understand the disease, understand the intricacies of how the disease interacts with things like socioeconomic conditions and race and all of those sorts of things that influence um, the way a man experiences his clinical journey and the way their family um, experiences that clinical journey as well. And so before I talk a little bit more about where we're going, I'd like to just kind of review quickly where we've been, um, because I think it, it sheds some light on some of the successes we've had, but also some of the challenges and some of the, the areas for improvement that, that we see as an organization. So just to put things in context, if you look at prostate cancer research in Canada, um, November started funding prostate cancer research in Canada in 2008. Um, since that time, it is, the, it is the second largest funder of, of prostate cancer research behind only the federal government, the Canadian Institutes for, for Health Research, or CIHR. Um, and Movember has funded over $107 million worth of um, research projects uh, across uh, Canada in that time. So to put that in context, that's one out of every $5 invested in prostate cancer research since 2008 has come from Movember. And I think that's something that I think people perhaps don't appreciate because traditionally Movember has been very much a, we come out, you know, sort of mid-October right around now and we kind of go away in mid-December after the, the fun of growing the mustache has, has gone away. And I think a lot of people perhaps don't understand um, where that money goes actually, or the extent to which that money is, is doing uh, incredible work. And so this sort of, I think, puts it in context of the, the, the countrywide uh, investment that's been made in the context of prostate cancer research. Um, so what results have we seen as an organization? You know, we've seen them right across the, the prostate cancer uh, journey, as I've termed it. We've seen revolutions in our understanding of the basic biology of prostate cancer. Um, we've identified new ways that we can, uh, we can identify and treat men with the most common forms of prostate cancer. So with, with you know, localized disease um, in the so-called translational science space. We've initiated trials to look at modern imaging tools, and I'll talk about one of those in just a minute, uh, to identify recurrent prostate cancer and improve how we deliver radiotherapy. Um, we've funded a lot of trials that look at how we, um, how chemotherapy drugs and, and anti-androgen drugs and ADT are, 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 um, are spaced out and, and, and sequenced in the advanced cancer setting. Um, through programs like True North and Ironman, we've worked hard on clinical quality and survivorship programs. Um, you know, our, our partnership with organizations like the Walnut Foundation, I think, are are are, uh, are typical of this, right? And, and this is an area that over the next few years, as you'll see, we we're hoping to get much more involved in as we as we move forward. We've looked at health economics. So how do you implement some of these new therapies, these new drugs, the new screening tools within the context of a single payer system like we have here in Canada? Um, and at the, at the same time, trying to understand, um, you know, the etiology of the disease, what causes it? Um, how can we prevent it? Uh, what are strategies to, to understand the, the distribution of the disease and how factors that perhaps are non-biological can influence um, prostate cancer incidences and, um, and outcomes. So I'll talk about quickly about uh, two such uh, success stories in my view. Um, I, you know, full disclosure, I'm a little bit biased. Uh, I had the pleasure for uh, a number of years uh, to work on the Canadian Prostate Cancer Genome Network um, and ultimately to lead it for a few years. Um, you know, this was a program which was the largest single investment that Movember has made in a single research project anywhere in the world. Um, it, it was a, a very large, generous uh, donation that, that made this all possible. And really it was a project that was aimed at understanding not just what are the 
the changes in the tumor DNA and the, the tumor biology that are associated with prostate cancer, but understanding which of those are important for determining whether or not a man has a uh, has a good clinical course or a poorer clinical course. And so, you know, this resulted, of course, in a number of different publications, which is great for all of our CVs, but at the same time resulted in four tests that are now in early stage um, clinical testing for uh, actually stratifying patients with with intermediate risk prostate cancer, localized prostate cancer, and uh, potentially changing the way that those patients are managed based on the, the, the genomic or genetic profile um, that those men have uh, in their tumor. Um, we've launched uh, as, as partners in a number of these programs, the CPCG and Canadian Prostate Cancer Genome Network. Uh, amongst them, we've launched the International Pan Prostate Cancer Group, which is a consortium of, of I believe it's nine or 10 groups now, uh, from all around the world to really tackle this problem in ways that individual countries can't, both in terms of just sheer number of specimens that we can we can work on, but also in terms of different uh, population demographics. You know, I had a quick look at some of the stats from the from our Canadian program just before I joined the call today, and you know, I was looking at the proportion of patients in those studies that are Caucasian, um, and it's it's about eighty four percent. You know, it's. Uh, I was actually surprised it was that low, uh, to be honest. You know, so we're missing an enormous amount of information about the differential biology um, of this disease, uh, and we know that this exists in in Asian populations, and in Afro Caribbean populations, and in Sub Saharan African populations, which you know, as you might expect, uh, differ genetically from from populations um, in North America and in the Caribbean. Um, so you know, we've we've invested globally to sort of try to uh, to, to leverage some of those resources that exist around the world. Um, we've invested heavily and are, are continuing to invest heavily in research around PSMA, prostate-specific membrane antigen imaging. Um, this is, a, for those who are not aware, this is a new imaging um, platform that can detect prostate cancer um, metastases with enormous sensitivity, much, much better sensitivity than has ever been seen before with things like bone scans. Um, and so, We've invested heavily in that, both here in Canada and around the world, to look at ways in which um, we can identify cancer um, that is recurrent following treatment earlier than we would have otherwise, and perhaps then allow us to intervene for those patients much, much earlier than would have been the case previously. And we've funded actually a large trial here in Canada out of uh, the University of Montreal with Dr. Cynthia Menard, which is looking at using PSMA imaging um, to uh, identify prostate cancer lesions that are present much, much earlier. And she's asking the question of if you, if you are able to identify those earlier than you would be with standard imaging, does that result in a change in the way that um, those patients are, are treated? Does it improve their outcomes? And you know, what are the health economic and um, other factors associated with quality of life and those sorts of things around changing management in that way? You know, again, it's it's, it's great if you can detect this cancer earlier, but does it ultimately matter in terms of producing a longer life for that man? And at the same time, does it affect their quality, quality of life um, adversely? We funded a lot of work, in, again, around PSMA and using PSMA as a potential therapeutic um, where we can actually detect the presence of this prostate-specific membrane antigen, which if I didn't say is a, is a protein that sort of lives on the, on the surface of prostate cancer cells. And actually targeting that with a chemical that allows us to very, um, very tightly focus a beam of, of uh, radioactivity right on the prostate cancer cells itself. This is a, a, a strategy called PSMA Theranostics, and it's actually been recently approved in the United States. It's still not approved here in Canada, um, but we're working hard to change that. Um, so, you know, there are a number of examples like this, and we could go on and on talking about some of the, the great successes that I think we've been involved with and, and will continue to be involved with. But really, my purpose of being here today is to talk about where we're going. And, you know, as I said, Movember is an organization that is, um, that is changing and growing in a lot of ways. And, and consequently, some of the models that have worked in the past may not work now and, and need to be expanded upon. And we need to reevaluate kind of the, 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 the ways in which we can have the best possible impact for the most men. And so with that in mind, I, I'd like to introduce you to the Global Real World Evidence Network, or what we 
call RWE, like most um, places we have our set of uh, fun acronyms. Um, RWE is our, our acronym of the day. Um, and so a lot of these problems I've, I've talked about uh, in terms of what the, the issue is around prostate cancer, but fundamentally it comes down to this. Um, prostate cancer is a disease that takes a very long time from diagnosis out to either death from natural causes or other causes, or unfortunately in, in some cases, uh, death from prostate cancer. That can be 20, 25 years in some cases. And therefore it's very difficult actually to study this disease in its earliest stages um, to ask what are the factors that result in a man being cured of his disease and never having to worry about um, prostate cancer again versus one who has all the same conditions, but at some point uh, has a relapse and, and goes on, unfortunately, to, to die from his prostate cancer. Um, you know, what are the differences there and how can we study them from day zero all the way out through the end of, of life? Um, what are the socioeconomic and um, ethnic and access to care uh, issues that, that prevent certain men from having good clinical outcomes or from having good quality of life after treatment. All of these things are important questions. And the problem is because of that long duration of the disease, it's very difficult to study and you need a lot of, of men to be involved, far more than you can ever have um, in an individual country. We're talking on the order of hundreds of thousands. Um, and so we kind of took a step back a number of years ago and reevaluated this. How can we start to change this? How can we be involved in this space? And can we use the power that we have as a global organization to bring together as many people as possible? And in fact, the end result of that is our RWE. And so the idea here is to accrue uh, expertise across disciplines and across populations. Um, to facilitate effective collaboration around the world and within countries, to coordinate that, that collaboration and to make sure it runs effectively, and to engage with men and their families directly. And I say, I emphasize a lot of men and their families because this problem is so large, it really does require a global solution with, uh, with enormous, um, uh, you know, enormous numbers of people that, that need to be involved. Um, you know, when we talk about things like, um, like ethnic differences in outcomes for prostate cancer. Because of course, uh, you know, when we stepped back and took a look at what we were funding, and, and as I said, with the Canadian project as an exemplar, you know, we found that, you know, the representation of, of non-Caucasians in our studies and in other people's studies was just, it was, it was glaring, right? And so there's really a need to step back and understand not just the biology, because I think that's important, but also the other factors that are associated with that, that may play a role or be associated with the, the differences in outcomes for, for men of color. You know, this is a couple of different articles um, that were published a, a few years, over the last few years, that sort of took this paradigm of um, black men have poor outcomes with prostate cancer. They have more aggressive outcomes. And, you know, I think there's this idea that, well, that must be biology. But in fact, um, it turns out that when you normalize out for some of the differences in, um, in, in, in income, in access to care, in some of those other socio socioeconomic factors, the biological uh, impacts, the biological factors actually fall out. And they don't actually seem to be making much difference at all. There's probably something uh, biological there. And I think Neil uh, talked about that probably earlier this morning, but um, there is an enormous impact of things that are non biological. And, and in fact, these, these studies have shown that you know, black men present with more aggressive disease on average, but have similar, if not better outcomes when you adjust for this. And so clearly there are factors that are non-biological that you know, we wouldn't be capturing um, if we just sort of pressed ahead with the same type of model that we were doing before. And you know, I like to use the analogy uh, that when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? When, when you're a biologist, you look for biology. And in fact, we need to be able to capture things that are not biology and that are, but that have potentially as much or more impact on the way men are actually experiencing their journey through prostate cancer. And so consequently, for the Global Real World Evidence Network, um, we will be actively seeking to identify and rectify 
the disparate causes, not just biological, but socioeconomic, cultural, um, economic, all of those sorts of things that influence um, health income disparities. So the RWE is going to be a, a, really a, a, a network of networks or a registry of registries that will accrue a half a million men from 600 partner institutions in 19 countries um, over the next five to 10 years. Um, with numbers of that scale, we have the ability to ask and answer questions that simply would not be possible um, when we're talking about cohorts that can be accrued within individual countries, which tend to be on the order of several hundred, maybe a thousand if, if, if possible. So we can accrue these men. We can identify the, the, all of the factors that, that they experience or that influence their journey through the, through the, uh, the cancer landscape. So, you know, what was their diagnosis like? What was their experience with biopsy? What was their primary treatment? Um, how did they experience it? Did they have side effects? What were those side effects? How, how, how severe were they? Do they exercise? Do they, what's their diet? Like all of those sorts of things that we can capture through both biological uh, data, but also what we call patient reported outcome metrics or PROMS data, where we can go in and, and, and learn from patients, you know, what were their experiences? Aggregate all of that information and fast track accrual to clinical trials um, at a global scale. So if you're, if you're a person in, in South Africa, for example, or in, in, uh, in Southeast Asia, you may not have access to some of the clinical trials that are ongoing in other places, but it by, by being part of this type of a registry, we can pull that information and identify those, those individuals that perhaps need to be um, fast tracked to, to some of those clinical trials. It allows us to centralize all of that data um, and by data, again, I mean biological and patient reported and, and sort of metadata, survivorship data, all into a central repository that clinicians and researchers from around the world can leverage. So if I have a study that I want to do and I say, you know, I'd really like to have a population of men who have a certain characteristic, I can go into this database, this registry, I can pull out what I want and I can ask that question um, on those men in particular. Because, you know, while there might be 50 men of interest in, in Canada, there might be a thousand around the world. And so my, the ability to ask and answer questions is very, very different, right? So, you know, we really see the Real World Evidence Network as a way of bringing together different research topics, different researchers and clinicians. And, and again, as I said, men and their families into this larger umbrella that where the whole is greater than, greater than the sum of the parts because there, there's just questions that we can ask with uh, a data set of this size that we would just never be able to in, in the past. I won't go into this uh, too much except to say that you know there are a number of avenues to this. It's not all about biological research. Um, a lot of it is, but it's also about things like um, survivorship groups like the Walnut Foundation being directly engaged with to learn from men you know, it, there's, there's data that we can capture from, from men like you and families, your families, that we haven't been capturing um, uniformly and that we haven't been learning from consequently. And so the Real World Evidence Network really aims to change that and to bring people in much closer to the process, engage with them in the research process, engage with them in the the the, the whole machinery of learning from, uh, from the disease and the, and the things that surround it. Um, we have two initial programs that I can announce uh, that have been launched publicly, but I can tell you about today. There are many more in the works, but really two initial programs since we launched the RWE late last year. The first is a program, um, a, a global program to prevent disease progression in men with um, high risk prostate cancer. And so, as I said, you know, in this sort of highest stage of the quote unquote localized prostate cancer, our goal here is to identify men who could potentially, in whom we could potentially pre uh, prevent progression to local or distant metastatic disease. Or if we can't do that, at least delay that and, and improve the, the duration and quality of their life. 
Um, we're also talking though in this, in this program about men with locally advanced disease. So this is disease that perhaps has spread, spread to a, uh, a local lymph node, um, although I'm not sure that's technically called locally advanced, but a, a, a local lymph node or has breached through the prostate capsule as well as men with oligometastatic disease. So as I said, this is the, the, the disease state where there's perhaps three or four spots of cancer outside of the gland that could potentially be given radiation therapy, very specific targeted radiation therapy and potentially be cured. This is really the last bastion of potential cure. And so all of these disease states really fit in under the umbrella of this program. Um, and the idea here is to, again, to leverage the international community to develop strategies that are both biological and non-biological to um, understand how do we prevent men from progressing to advanced disease. You know, philosophically, I think as a group, we feel that the best way to prevent men from dying of metastatic prostate cancer isn't necessarily to learn how to treat metastatic prostate cancer better. It's to prevent men from getting metastatic prostate cancer in the first place. And so the process there is really to identify those strategies up front so that we can focus in on this, this disease group and make sure that these men are having much better outcomes than they currently are. Um, we have a global steering committee that's been engaged um, in this process. Um, there are 33 investigators now around the globe. Uh, a steering committee has a set of five global experts from all disciplines of prostate cancer research from um, urology, radiation oncology, basic science, radiology, um, epidemiology, psychosocial health, uh, and so forth. And so we have a team now that we're, we've assembled. And ultimately the goal here is to, as I said, to develop a, what we've called a biomarker informed treatment strategy, but it's really about a um, uh, using as much data as we can to inform our treatment strategy, to ensure the right treatment for the right patient at the right time um, for men with advanced disease. Um, so as I said, we had, we had 45 uh, expressions of interest from which we are now 33 investigators involved in this. Um, we are fi finalizing the sort of uh, final proposal right now, and we should see a launch of this as, a, as an active research project with, within the next six months or so. And this will be a five to seven year program really aimed at, as I said, identifying ways in which we can improve, improve outcomes for these men and reduce the number of men that are progressing. And our, our goal, it's an ambitious one, but our goal is a 30% reduction in, uh, in the number of men um, with advanced prostate cancer. And the first way we achieve that um, is by making sure that men with the highest grade, um, highest stage cancer that's localized to the prostate is, are not progressing uh, to the more advanced stage. The second program I can tell you about quickly is, is really the other side of the localized story. And that's a program looking to develop a dynamic risk adapted approach to active surveillance. So these are men who um, traditionally have low risk disease. And um, we know that very, very few men with low risk disease are going to um, go on to die from prostate cancer. Um, it's, it's substantially less than 1% of those men. But the fact remains that those men are still experiencing bad outcomes and we need to identify why that is. Why are these men um, dying of their prostate cancer? And um, you know, if we can identify them up front and perhaps say that they're not candidates for active surveillance. Conversely, can we identify men accurately who have more indolent disease and can be safely triaged into, into active surveillance programs? And you know, we've already seen this here in Canada uh, you know, I think we're in a good position around access surveillance, and it's not necessarily the same around the world um, because of the the, the historical um, historical prevalence of active surveillance programs here in Canada. It was really developed first by Lori Klotz um, at Sunnybrook here in Toronto. Um, but can we identify subsets of men with intermediate risk disease who have good clinical features or good pathological features that could in fact be offered active surveillance? And we're already seeing this. There already are men with with a favorable intermediate risk uh, disease that are, that are safely being offered active surveillance. So, you know, the, the goal here is really to maximize the size of that red circle. You know, it's to understand what is the, what is the maximum number of men that can safely be placed onto active surveillance programs. And the fact is we just simply don't know how to do that right now. Um, you know, there's a, there's a striking statistic. When you look at men with low risk prostate cancer, Black men with lowest prostate cancer have a two-fold increased risk of dying of prostate cancer. Again, the absolute numbers are low, still below 1%, but actually have a two-fold increased risk of death versus non-Black men 
of dying from low risk prostate cancer. And the question is, you know, why is that the case? Is it biological? Perhaps. Are there other factors at play there? Also perhaps. And so understanding all of those factors that go into this uh, are really the, the sort of uh, um, the, the keys to this new program. Um, the, the focus on, of this program, again, will be around personalization of, of, of active surveillance across the board, right? So how do we get more men to consider active surveillance? How do we get more physicians in non-academic centers where you know, they might not be uh, up to date on the recent literature? Um, how do we educate them and, and, and help them help their patients to understand whether or not they should consider active surveillance and talk about the risks and benefits of, of considering that? Um, is there a tool that we can develop for use in the clinic that takes into consideration all of the factors that influence um, a man's decision? and develop uh, a, a unified strategy, a unified tool that we can implement in this, in, this, uh, in this setting. So the call for this went out just recently, about two months ago. Um, we are just now in the sort of assembling a, a global steering committee phase. We have, I believe it was 80 applications for people from around the world, from, from research groups that uh, are looking to participate in this type of an endeavor. So you can see there's already great uptake. Um, from the research community. So 80 groups that span the breadth of, uh, of interests, again, from basic science all the way to um, what sometimes are called the soft sciences, although I don't love that term, but you know things like psychosocial supports and, and um, epidemiology and those sorts of things. And so the goal here um, is, as I said, to maximize the number of men who are, are, are choosing active surveillance as their first option. And so we've set ourselves the goal of a threefold increase. Um, and this is safely, right? So it's not just about telling men that they should go on active surveillance. It's telling men that they should go on active surveillance because their outcome is extraordinarily likely to be good on active surveillance. So to summarize, you know, Movember has put in a lot of money, invested a lot of money, over $107 million since 2008. Um, and we're proud of that, that investment. And I think we've seen enormous strides across the, 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 the breadth of prostate cancer research from localized disease all the way to advanced metastatic disease and, and everywhere in between. Um, but we think that the time is right now to, to start to think about implementing a lot of those uh, research findings that we've, we've made. Our decision or our approach will be to fund less of the basic science type of thing and much more of the how do we turn those discoveries that we've made since 2008 into new therapies, new drugs, new treatment types, um, better ways of triaging patients and so forth. Um, so we think we can do that through unprecedented global collaboration. We create this registry of, of, as I said, a half a million men that can be drawn on by anyone who wants to, to ask these type of pertinent questions um, to explicitly, not just happenstance, but explicitly address inclusion of men who have been underrepresented in biomedical research and support programs. And so I, I can't stress enough how much this is an ongoing core part of the RWE is to make sure that the findings that come out of these uh, studies are representative to the extent possible of the global population, which is not 84 uh, percent, you know, Caucasian men in our Canadian study. It's, it's very different than that, obviously. And so we need to make sure um, that we address that and that everybody who applies for funding through the RWE is going to need to, to have um, a statement of how uh, inclusion and equity is part and parcel of the project that they are proposing. Um, ultimately, as I've said, we want to reduce the number of men who are being diagnosed with or progressing to life-threatening disease. And there's a number of ways that we can go about that. Um, advocacy is going to be a part of RWE. Uh, and I haven't spoken about that, but this is going to be a space you'll see Movember start to move into, um, particularly here in Canada, where we've seen Prostate Cancer Canada amalgamate with the CCS and, and really leave that space kind of wide open. And so you'll see Movember more and more start to move into the space of advocacy. That doesn't necessarily just mean lobbying government. It means advocacy in terms of education. It means advocating for to, to, to primary care physicians, to specialist physicians, to men directly, um, and to, potentially to government as well. So 
I just want to say thank you again to to Ken um, and to everybody for coming today and 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 listening and uh, and inviting me here to talk today. It's an exciting time at November. Um, as I said, a lot of things are changing, but a lot of things are changing. We hope for the good and the more inclusive and the more impactful. And you know, watch this space. So thanks again. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Um, very informative and. I think it's refreshing to see the work that Movember is doing in this space. Um, we've got a number of questions. Um, I'm going to ask um, Nana if she can read the questions for you. Okay. Um, okay, Dr. Farida. The first question is, how is Movember regarding research on low-risk prostate cancer and active surveillance? Is Movember involved in advocacy in addition to research. So I suspect this <laughs> <Yes>. was read <laughs> before the end, right? So yes, absolutely. So so yeah. it, 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 it's a space that we have not been in um, traditionally because, uh, you know, it was the way that the organization was set up. It was very much, we funded programs through Prostate Cancer Canada and they would go out and be the advocacy group. And, and that worked very well. Now with Prostate Cancer Canada no longer existing, there's a space open for that. And, and we have heard loud and, loud and clear, and unfortunately Atika Mohammed was supposed to be on the call today. She, she couldn't make it, but mm -hmm. she and I have worked um, over the last year and a half really uh, to talk to groups like the Walnut Foundation and others to understand, you know, mm -hmm. and, and heard loud and clear the importance of Movember getting into that space. And so we're very much mm -hmm. committed to that. Um, we have just actually hired a, a, a global director of advocacy. And so you will start to see that funnel down into, into programs. So not just in low risk disease, but right across the, the spectrum. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Second question. Um, could you say what criteria is used to select countries for the global RWE network? And also how many African countries are included in this network? Right. So um, largely, I mean, the... There's two ways of thinking about this, right? So the first is to think about where the researchers are located. Um, and the second is to think about where the patients and, and, and men associated with the, with the projects are located. So I'll give you a perfect example. Um, so we partner with um, Dr. Vanessa Hayes, who is in Sydney, Australia. Um, but she is the, world, I think, unquestioned world leader um, in looking at the the genomics and the biology of prostate cancer in sub-Saharan African men and has shown enormous, um, really just groundbreaking work around the differences in those diseases, not just compared to the to Caucasian men and, and Asian men, but compared to uh, Afro-Caribbean men in North America, completely different disease. And so she's not based in Africa, but she, she works very closely with local collaborators. So November will... I mean, the, the calls are open. It's ultimately mm -hmm. up to the research communities to, um, to put together applications for this type of funding. Uh, we, we distribute as broadly as we possibly can. We have formal collaborations in South Africa, um, and, but we have access to whatever sort of the researchers, researchers have. So it's difficult for us to be in each country but it's easy for, easier for individual researchers to forge those collaborations and to say, you know, this is an aspect of, that is being under, under addressed and we need to assemble um, patients and researchers and clinicians in those countries to, to actually bring these forward. Okay, great, thank you. And um, third question, when do you see the PSMA imaging being widely used in the Toronto area? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, so, you know, a lot of you will know of the registry that's open um, through Princess Margaret and a couple of other um, uh, institutions across Ontario um, and really is the only way to get access to PSMA at the moment. So we are working on that, that problem. It's not a, I can't really give you a, a, a date specifically in terms of when this is going to be available. I would hope that it would be um, as soon as possible. You know, I think one of the challenges in Canada is that, you know, to get something like PSMA imaging approved, there has to be really strong evidence that it changes practice and that it results in differential outcomes, right? And so there has to be that evidence collected. Um, as I said, we're funding a very large trial in that space uh, out of the University of Montreal. And so hopefully that will go a long way to, to changing that narrative and, and to getting people um, 
to think about approving this. But, you know, unfortunately, I can't put a date on it at the moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. And last question, sorry, um, last, last one question. Given the high incidence of prostate cancer in the Caribbean area, will you be including those countries in your logo? In your yeah, logo so here? again, yeah. Same, the same, same answer is that, you know, it, it ultimately, uh, absolutely, but it ultimately mm -hmm. depends on, on researchers. But, you know, I will say just to preface or just to, to, to put a, an end to that question or, or to the bookends on that question, that's the word I'm looking for, is to so, sort of say, this issue of inclusion and, um, and equi equity and including underrepresented communities is part of this, right? And so it, it's not just, it would be great to see. And, you know, the, the panels that are reviewing these programs kind of can say like, well, you know, it's like one of the tick bark boxes on the, on the application. It's actually required. So you've got to have this. And so it, we've issued the challenge to researchers and clinicians to say, Go out and force those collaborations. Go out and identify your colleagues who are working in, in the Caribbean or in Africa or wherever it is. Identify those, those cohorts and work with them and come back with global networks that, um, that, uh, that don't exist today, potentially, right? Yeah, okay. Okay. And last, there's one more. <laughs> okay. are there, yeah, are there any alternative medication in the health store for prostate yeah. cancer? Uh, unfortunately, I can't. I can't comment on on anything related to that. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Mike. I, you know, really appreciate it. It's been great uh, presentation and really great to hear the things that Movember is doing. A lot of people do ask us with all the money that Movember is raising, what are they doing with it? Yeah. So it's been great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um.